Sometimes Nick Mick has shown that the grooming behavior just starts with, hey, that's great. Look what you're doing. Um, this is an awesome build. Let's build together again. Or just something as simple as liking what they do and befriending them. Then they feel like this virtual person is actually their friend when they don't know who they are in real life. Ooh, I need to be. Welcome back to Mom Nation from the Heart. And now a word from our sponsor. Hello, this is Veronica with Spa Specialist Beauty Within, where we believe that beauty truly starts from within. Being healthy on the inside will definitely show on the outside. You can purchase gift certificates, buy products, book your spa services, or even holistic coaching right from our website at www.spaspecialistbeautywithin.com or call us at 603-858-1556. Have an amazing day. Hey, Mom Nation, we are back with another episode of From the Heart, where we share inspirational stories, useful information, and we discuss a variety of women and mom-related topics. I am Katie, the founder of Mom Nation, and I am so excited to welcome our guest for today, Stacy Hurd. Stacy, welcome. Thank you. So Stacy and I are going to talk about a topic that some of you mamas haven't dealt with yet. Some of you mamas are currently dealing with, and some of you are probably glad that you're no longer dealing with anymore. And we're, we're going to be talking about the topic of sexting. So Stacy, this is your expertise. You take it away. Tell us, um, you know, maybe go into first to the, the dangers and kind of some things that you're, you're seeing out there in this world. So but really before we get to the actual sexting, some of the more broad dangers we're seeing are just kids out there with electronic devices and what we think about with electronic devices are not just phones people jump to phones automatically but all electronic devices including ipods um, gaming systems where you can talk to people live like uh, ps4s and xboxes pcs where you can game live um, any electronic device where you can share electronic information messaging and images, we see kids oversharing information. And the oversharing inf information starts with just personal information about themselves, about their families, about their pets, about their schools. And that's then maybe what gets them to be too comfortable with information sharing that then leads to more graphic image sharing. So what we talk about in, in the uh, area of sexting is backing up before we get to sexting and talking generally about internet safety. Mm. So when we wanna talk about internet safety, we wanna talk about some of those platforms that some parents aren't aware of and some of those platforms that parents are aware of but don't realize how dangerous they can be. There are platforms out there that I frankly had never heard of until I got the call. Hey, my kid is on this. What do you know about it? Or, hey, we had this incident occur. What do we do? One of those platforms is called Omegle. And I don't know if anybody has heard about that. I have not. No. No, I didn't know about it either until I started teaching this class. And it is a platform that allows random chatting with strangers. There are a lot of platforms out there that allow you to get on the app and just pop up a chat with a stranger. And that leads to the ability to pop up a random video with a stranger. If you could imagine what our kids might be getting exposed to with random chats and random videos popping up. They're supposed to, some of them, filter ages, but we all know how easy it is to lie about an age, right? Right, right. So it's so, not, so that's really interesting, not to interrupt you there, but that's super interesting to me because I, I have an almost eight-year-old, so I'm starting to worry about this, right? I probably should be very, very worried about this at this point because he is using electronics. But in my mind, 
I'm thinking, okay, it's going to be somebody at school or, you know, like a peer or a friend or somebody like that, that he's communicating with. But what you're saying is that's not always the case. No, in fact, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which we refer to as NCMEC, follows um, predator-related contacts. And what they find is that 98% of those contacts are done by strangers. Wow. They did a big study in 2015 where they, they studied over 6,000 cases and 78% of those 98% contacts were directed at girls. Wow. Now, most of these are done through various platforms. A lot of them are done through what seem like innocuous or innocent first contacts. One of these, um, one of the games that always comes up in my research are games directed at kids, Roblox and Minecraft, which mm. you're probably familiar with having a younger kid. My kid plays Minecraft because it allows people to, to get on these worlds and talk to each other and build together. So you have to sometimes monitor if they're on live and able to talk to people that they're building with what's being said. Sometimes Nick Mick has shown that the grooming behavior just starts with, hey, that's great. Look what you're doing. Um, this is an awesome build. Let's build together again. Or just something as simple as liking what they do and befriending them. Then they feel like this virtual person is actually their friend when they don't know who they are in real life. Mm. So that then leads to their comfort level increasing and they start thinking that everybody that they know virtually is trustworthy. That's crazy. And so you're seeing it as, as young as, as my kid and probably even younger, huh? Well, I, we are seeing it pretty young. I can tell you that I consulted on a case outside our county last year um, where a nine-year-old was involved on the Omegle platform. The child's parents did not know about the involvement on the Omegle platform. The child started randomly chatting with strangers just because they were in a rural area, didn't feel like the child really had anybody to talk to. Remember last year was pretty isolating for everyone. Yeah. And, and so the child started randomly chatting with people, started then being uh, com comfortable with people, started sending um, some pictures of themselves to these people, and ultimately started getting inquiries back saying, hey, do you want to meet? Hey, do you want to have um, sexual activity? And then the parents learned that some of these people were actually in their area. Wow. And this, like I said, this was a nine-year-old. I then got consulted because one of the law enforcement officers on the case threatened to charge the nine-year-old with um, some criminal behavior. And I can tell you in our county, that probably wouldn't happen. We see this child as a victim, obviously, mm -hmm. but the parents had no idea the child was involved in this activity and didn't know that it happened until a notification popped up on the phone soliciting a meeting in real life. Wow. So as parents, like I told you, my, my child plays Minecraft and I'm probably need to be a little bit more on top of that. Although I ask him, Hey, do you ever talk to anybody? Do you ever build with anyone? And he doesn't. And, um, on his particular device, he doesn't even have the internet. He's, he's not able to get on the internet on that. Um, <clears throat> well, I guess he would be if he's downloading Minecraft. So, so I'm obviously very confused about the different restrictions that we as parents can put on the devices. Can you speak to that at all? Every platform is different. Every game is different. You can go in on <clears throat> Xbox, for instance, which is a Microsoft product and get a Microsoft account and put security restrictions on the account. You can go in on the Xbox itself and say whether or not they can join parties or they can have people that they don't know 
um, contact them. You just have to go into each gaming system or each platform and set restrictions. Not every app though has that ability. Mm-hmm. You know, there are, there are certain apps like Facebook where you can contact, you know, people can contact your kids that have much more limited restrictions than others. So I, I find from talking to kids in junior high and high school, there's always a way around restrictions. Always. Yeah. Um, one of the big, one of the things I always talk to parents about, one of the apps I always talk to parents about is the calculator app. And most parents, I would say I have yet to run into a parent that is aware of the calculator app. There is an app called calculator. There are lots of them, but there's one specific one called calculator. And there are other calculator apps that are actually vaults. It looks like a calculator app, but when you put in a code on the calculator, it opens a vault where it hides messages. It hides a capability to do secret messaging. It hides videos and it hides photos. So I always tell parents, if your child has a calculator app on their device, they're hiding something because every device we know comes with a calculator. You don't need a calculator app to do any calculations that you right. need to do for a math class. You either need a specialized calculator that you have to go buy for your class, or you can use the calculator that's already on your device. If they have an app, it's probably a vault. Yeah, no clue about that either. So thank you for sharing that information. What kinds of changes would maybe as parents, would we see in our kids that have started this relationship with a stranger online? Are there any indicators of different things that we could sort of pick up on, um, you know, outside of logging into their device to see what's going on. I mean, I don't even know if I could log into Minecraft and know where to find this. So it, it's really going to be child dependent. I think back in the day, they used to tell you to watch for changes in your kids when they were using drugs. Yeah. Sometimes it's going to be the same sort of indicators. Are they, you know, are they secretive? Are they moody? Are they, are they, um, seeming stressed? Are they having problems at school? Are there just any behavioral changes that you're seeing? Are you want to find out what's going on? Does it necessarily mean that this is what's happening? No, but obviously when you see any changes in your child, you want to investigate and see what's going on with your, with your child. It may not have anything to do with stranger contact, or it may, you just want to find out what's going on. One of the, one of the um, situations that we have been seeing is that when strangers are enticing kids to send them pictures, they then are extorting them and threatening them to send them more pictures by saying, I know where you live. I know where you go to school. I know where your siblings go to school. I'm going to harm your family if you don't keep sending me pictures. And that leads them to become obviously very upset, very stressed, and feeling very ashamed that they got got in this situation. There have been situations recently, not in our state, but in other states where children have taken their lives because they just didn't know how to reach out and how to deal with it. Wow. That's sad. So as a parent, what suggestions do you have on, on bringing this up? Obviously, depending on the age, it's going to be a different conversation. I am constantly talking to my kids about not oversharing, about the consequences of oversharing, about the consequences of what we put out in the world, just generally because what we put out in the world can have consequences for our adult future. It's just a kind of a constant open conversation that we should be having with our kids in the context of life these days. Mm. They're all, they're digital natives. They're always connected somehow. So, hey, let's think about what we're putting out there because maybe in the future you want to go to a certain school and they're going to check and see what you have been doing online before they accept you. 
hey, that meme that you thought was funny when you were 14, your college might not have thought was funny when you posted it because it was offensive or racist, racist or sexist or whatever. I, we're constantly having conversations about how we're representing ourselves in real life and online because everybody's watching these days. Mm -hmm. The other thing we talk about is safety generally. If you're posting a picture, make sure you know what's in that picture. Last year, there was a, a fairly well-known rapper in Los Angeles that posted a picture of himself, actually a picture of a swag bag that he received at a, a house where he was staying. He didn't realize that the address of the house was on that bag in that picture. And some young men who were 15, basically freshmen in high school, went to rob him because they knew that he had this really awesome diamond encrusted Rolex. They went and, and murdered him and robbed him because he didn't realize that he'd posted the address where he was staying on Insta. Wow. Just constant conversations about caution and being careful about what we're posting. And this is all before we ever got to these, these sexting images. Yeah. Which is a crime. <laughs> Well, well, that's just it, right? I actually just recently learned a situation that a friend had had, just recently learned that sharing explicit images of others without their permission is a felony. So if we're talking, are we talking adults or are we talking children because they're different? Tell me the difference. In this particular instance, it was an adult. Right. So... I deal with children mostly and adults is a, that's a whole nother, a whole nother um, ball of wax, but it's a crime when you're a child, even to have a picture of another child, even with consent. So that, you know, wrap your head around that. What happens most of the time is pictures are traded between boyfriends and girlfriends. Right. So um, research shows that girls are um, sending these pictures either to feel sexy or as a joke, which I still don't understand. I don't see how this would ever be considered a joke, but that's how the research has borne out that they do it as a joke either or to feel sexy or because they felt pressured to do it. Mm. And so they're trading these pictures Mostly it's the girls sending pictures to the boys. So this is, there's a huge double standard because as we know, once the picture goes out, you can't get it back mm -hmm. and you don't know where it goes. 55% of people who, who, well, sorry, 17% of people who say they have received pictures, say they have sent it on to someone else. And 55% of those people say they've given it to more than one other person. So once you send that picture, you have no control of where it goes and you can almost be guaranteed that it's going to at least one other person besides the one you sent it to and probably more than one other person. And so, so that's not consent, right? That or is not, that is not consent, but in our, in Arizona, consent doesn't matter because we've made it a strict liability law. Mm-hmm. So if a picture is sent or shown, that's what the interesting part is. You can send it or you can have it on your device and just show it on your device to someone. It's the same. So if it is sent or shown and it's, it depicts explicit sexual material, it is a crime. It's a juvenile crime because our legislature recognized that if a person is under 18 and they're engaging in this activity with another juvenile, um, it wouldn't be fair to them to place them in adult court and place them under something that's going to probably follow them for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. So the first time they do it, it's a class three misdemeanor. And the second time they do it, it's a class two misdemeanor. Now, that all sounds pretty minimal until you realize that in juvenile court, crime classifications don't really matter because once you get into juvenile court, the juvenile judge has jurisdiction over you until you're 18 and can impose what 
whatever conditions they believe will be appropriate upon you to rehabilitate your behavior. Wow. So they can place you on probation until you're 18. They can make you do some sort of education and counseling until you're 18, community service, fines. And if you don't get with the program, you can be placed in detention. The judge can keep you there for that crime until your 18th birthday. Wow. Even if it's a class three misdemeanor. For an adult, a class three misdemeanor is a maximum of 30 days and a $500 fine. In juvenile court, that's not the case. Mm. Now, for sexting as a juvenile as well, if you're one of these people that just receives it and you didn't ask to receive it, because we have that happen in schools, a picture gets sent to someone, that someone sends it to five friends, those five friends send it to five friends, those five friends send it to five friends, pretty soon, you know, 400 people get this picture often through the airdrop process. If you're one of those people that just gets a picture airdrop to you, you didn't ask for it, you didn't want it, and you um, do your best to delete it or you go to a parent, guardian, school official or law enforcement official to help you get rid of it, then you're not in violation of possessing that image. So there is a way around it if you do the right thing. The mm -hmm. legislature recognized that we want to reward kids for doing the right thing, for reporting and deleting and not passing it along, which I think is a good thing, except that we all know kids are impulsive and don't always want to be the ones that go to the principal or go to the parent or go to the law enforcement and say, hey, look what's going on. Well, right, because that can potentially cause them issues, you know, in a social way in, in their circle of friends, right? Absolutely. It, it absolutely can. We had a young lady locally who sent a very, very graphic video to her boyfriend in an effort to show him her seriousness about their relationship. They did not go to the same school. He promised her he wouldn't share that video. He promised her that he was alone when she sent it to him. He was not alone. He was at a party and he, of course, immediately shared that video. Oh, my. That video got out to her school. And somebody followed the law and reported it to an official at the school. She was an athlete at her school. She was National Honor Society at her school. She was engaged in lots of activities at her school and she was suspended and removed from her activities. The young man who did not go to her school did not face any of those consequences. Why? Well, that would have to be taken up with school officials but these, that this goes to what you said about social consequences. We don't know who, were, who reported it, reported. if anyone at his school, gotcha. but we know that somebody did the right thing at her school. And so she suffered consequences and he did not have the same sort of consequences. Wow. But one of the things that is really scary really, really scary about these situations is that kids who trade videos like this or pictures like this don't realize that a lot of times they, these pictures stay on their devices or stay in their cloud or God forbid, go to their parents' cloud somehow because their devices are connected to their cloud, their parents' cloud accounts. And when they get older, like when they turn 18, they still somehow have possession of these images. So when they turn 18 and maybe they get a new phone and they go to the cloud to transfer their information from the old phone to the new phone and up pop these images from their girlfriend who you know, they had when they were 15 or 16, but now they're 18, now they're in possession, not of sexted images under the juvenile statute. 
Now they're in possession of child pornography. Wow. Because they're 18 and it doesn't matter when those pictures were taken. It only matters that they possess it and they're pictures of a juvenile. Wow. I can imagine how, if it goes to the parents' cloud, unbeknownst to the parents, how this can be majorly impactful on the parents' lives. Right. And majorly impactful on this 18 year old's life now, because if somehow it gets reported and they're 18 and they possess it, now it's not a class three misdemeanor, it's a class two felony. The only class felony, which is more serious, being murder. Wow. And it's the, the punishment for this crime now child pornography is between 10 and 24 years in prison per picture. Wow. That that's a suit. And that's assuming the picture is of a child who's under 15. If it's of a child over 15, it's between three and 12 and a half years per picture. Still not that it matters. Yeah. I <laughs> yeah. mean, that adds up. Right. So for a video, is it per video? Or is it, it a is. certain amount of time? It is per video. It's just per item. Oh, okay. So what's the difference then adult to adult? Just kind of skating into that area real quick, because I'm sure there's people out there that are curious. So if there's, con- if so adult to adult, if you're doing it, if it's consensual, then it's consensual. And there really isn't a crime that covers it which I think is part of the reason our kids think it's okay. Mm. Because if adults are sexting, then why shouldn't we, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if it's non-consensual, it's probably being handled under what we consider revenge porn statute. Mm. And that typically requires that it's being done with the intent to harm, harass, intimidate, threaten, or coerce the person in the image or the person they say is in the image. But without knowing specific facts, I can't speak to adult to adult. Typically, adults, when they are disclosing non-consensual images, are doing it to get back at another adult. Right. That's, that's usually the scenario we see it in. We either see it because they're trying to harass a public official, we see that a lot, go figure. And mm-hmm. it's, not, it's not usually pictures of the actual public official. They find pictures, they cut off heads of someone and they say, this is public official X, look what the disgusting behavior they're engaging in. That is also considered under this statute because it doesn't have to be a picture of the actual person. They just have to say it's of that person with the intent to harm, harass, or coerce them to do something. Well, yeah, it's harassment. I mean, absolutely. Really? Now, the interesting thing about that statute is that it's either a class four or a class five felony. Now, it's a class, it used to be, it used to be you had to do that with like paper or hard photographs. But since we've gotten into the digital age, all you have to do now is basically click a button. So if you're doing it through snail mail or on paper flyers, it's a class five felony because it's harder to do. But if you're doing it with through electronic means, it's a class four felony, which is more serious. And so they just made it, if it's easier to do, they made it a more serious offense. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wow. My mind is totally blown right now. So how does this happen very frequently? I mean, is it um, to assume that, hey, I've got two or three kids and it's going to happen to one of them? Is that a a correct assumption or are you, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, are you seeing this a lot, basically? So... (laughs) So I hear from the schools that they see quite a bit of it, but we don't see it a lot in our office because it's handled more at the school level with the understanding that it's a behavioral and teaching issue more than it is a criminal issue. 
That could change though, depending on how school officials choose to handle it, depending on who the elected official in the county attorney's office is. You know, our elected official, Mr. Kent Volkmer, understands that this is a behavioral and social issue that needs to be handled in a manner that makes it stop as opposed to in a manner of putting everybody in juvenile court. Mm -hmm. You know, are we going, is prosecuting a kid for doing something that they need to be taught with understanding why we don't do this? You know, which is more effective? Mm -hmm. There are, there have been some big instances in other counties. I think Gila County had one about a year and a half ago where hundreds of kids were engaging in it. And that, that became a big problem at one particular school. And so it was many images or it was an image of just one person? It was, it was many images. And so I'm sure teachers, principals, you know, people that are in school, adults that are in school come across this in different ways. What is their tip? And I'm sure schools are all different. So this might be difficult to answer, but what is their typical steps in the process once something like this has been discovered? Or maybe this, you know, this poor gal's being harassed because of an image that got leaked or something like that. Like, what is their process? You know, I can't answer that. I don't know. And I, I can say, I think it depends what level of school we're at. I hear about it a lot at middle school level. Really? Yes. And that's where they're complaining about it being a problem more than other schools. I think by high school, the schools aren't even really worrying about it too much. It's middle school level that I'm hearing about it being a problem. Sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, frankly. And that's between students um, or like the example that we discussed with the Xbox, some stranger or or both really between students. Yeah. Yeah. What age are you finding or what age group are you finding is the most vulnerable to the whole stranger thing? I mean, that scares the crap out of me. So kids between 12 and 15 are pretty vulnerable to stranger contact because they really are in that age where they want to be older. They want yeah. to be doing older things. And what, what uh, research has found is a lot of the strangers don't even have to pretend to be younger. They, they can say, Hey, I'm 24, I'm 30, however old they are. And kids in the 12 to 15 age range are really enticed by that because they're, they're really, really wanting to be older than they are at that age. Mm -hmm. It's so scary. I mean, you know, again, my, my kids coming up on eight and I'm just like, wow, I, I will definitely be paying a little bit more attention. And I feel like, you know, I, I feel like I'm not an absent mom. I mean, he's not able to use his device when he's alone in his room. You know, he's got to kind of be with us. Um, and I do ask him, Hey, do you ever talk to anyone? Do you ever play with your friends on Minecraft? And he says, no, he just builds and, and does his own thing. Um, but it's, it's such a huge worry of mine. Um, any advice for parents out there that, are in my shoes that are just kind of freaked out about it. And it's just, the ball is just beginning to roll. So two things, always make sure you have access to all of their accounts, passwords, everything. What, you know, one of the big rules is you should have, be able to have access to whatever platforms they're on so that they know that you can check on them. Even if you don't make mm -hmm. them know that you have access. The other is that I find always illuminating. Hey, what are your friends on? What are you, what platforms are the new latest, greatest platforms? Can you show me what they do? Why are they exciting? Why are they entertaining? What are kids doing with them? That, you know, that is one of the ways I learn about some of the platforms. I ask kids these things. Um, one of our juvenile probation officers learned about the platform OnlyFans that way. And I don't know if you've heard of OnlyFans. Never. OnlyFans was a platform that allowed or does allow people to post videos for sharing 
and also has a pay element where people can pay for just your subscription if you want them to. That sounds so, dangerous. Well, yes. So then it leads to you can post all kinds of interesting content if and have paid subscribers. So people learn that they could earn money by having paid subscribers and posting all kinds of their own risque video that way. And kids were learning that they could earn money that way. We had some juveniles with their own OnlyFans subscriber accounts. And I can only imagine who was subscribing to teenage OnlyFans accounts. So what happens to these people? Is this not something that's regulated because there are apps that are just constantly coming out and it's difficult to keep up with? Well, you can imagine that the people subscribing are all over the world. Yeah. So it's not easy to track them down. There are the NICMIC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, when they do get hits for people who are downloading certain content, Part of what they do is feed that information to law enforcement wherever they find downloading occurring so that a case can be built. We, we, um, we do, as a law enforcement community, participate in that. And we have had several arrests in the last year related to information being provided by that organization just in our county. Wow. Wow. Now, I know that you had mentioned, and, and I'm devastated by it, that, um, you know, some children go as far as to end their own lives because they uh, are having trouble processing what's going on and dealing with what's going on. Um, do children also come up missing that might have been involved in something like this? They do. But when kids come up missing, it's hard to know why. Mm -hmm. There are always suspicions that they're involved in things like this, but it's not, I cannot think of a case specifically where we know that um, kids disappeared because they had contact with a stranger. There are, mo it's more likely that they disappeared with um, people that they knew. Hmm. That's something that that scares me a bunch, too. And I know it's a little bit off topic um, and this is not my area of expertise by any means. But I've heard that uh, here in Arizona, we've got a bit of a child trafficking problem. Is is that true? It is true. We, we do. I wouldn't say just here in Arizona. I would say as a country, we have quite a child trafficking problem. Um, and I wouldn't call it just child trafficking. We have a sex trafficking problem in general, mm -hmm. it's not. And I think people are under the impression that it's just a, you know, kids are being abducted for sex trafficking. But a lot of what we see is kids either running away and getting involved um, to survive on the street with traffickers. Mm -hmm. But I worked as a guardian ad litem for several years, and I represented some kiddos who were um, in the state system who had been trafficked by parents. Wow. So it, it's not just, you know, sort of the quintessential, what we think of as trafficking. It, it comes from all areas and all places. It's just um, people don't realize necessarily what's going on. We have had kids get involved with it through friends at school as a way to, you know, first make some money. They mm -hmm. just, Hey, look at this great purse I've got kind of thing. And, and this is how I got it. And then they get sucked in. They're still living at home with their parents. Their parents just don't realize what's going on. So one of the big red flags for that is if your child starts coming home with lots of really expensive new things, yeah, you need to find out how that's happening. Are there any other tips, things to look out for that you would suggest parents pay more attention to, anything like that? <laughs> no, There's probably not, a lot. I, I can see yeah, all the wheels turning. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
just that open dialogue with your kids is so important. Just, just talking to them, Hey, what, you know, what are the new games? What are, what are the new platforms that you're, you're on? Just what are kids at school talking about? Just, just always learning about the the things that they're doing digitally. And I like that approach because I feel like that's an easy conversation to have. I feel like that's something that I know my kid, you know, if I sit him down and I say, Hey, you know, how was school today? What'd you learn? I don't know. Or if I say, what fun thing happened today on the playground or what did you have for lunch? Or what are the other kids bringing in their lunch bags to, you know, he's little. So these are the conversations we have. He's a lot more excited and can remember (laughs) a lot better you know, when, when I approach it that way. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I feel like they like to talk about those types of things and, and, you know, what other people are doing and stuff like that. Right. One of the things I always do because I, they, you know, they think I'm really old. So I'm like, well, can you show me, can you teach me? Because I don't understand, show me how this works, teach me what it does. And they, you know, they always like to do that. Oh, mom. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. Right. I know how you feel. I'm 42 and I feel like I'm 142 when it comes to my kid. It's so funny. Um, he'll always say to me, well, back in your day, I'd be like, geez, dude, it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> oh my goodness, Stacy. Well, it's been a pleasure to chat with you. Um, what, what a crazy topic. And I'm sure that there are just so many things that you deal with on a daily basis that blow your mind. I mean, this conversation has totally blown mine. Um, and, and thank you. Thank you for sharing this because I think that um, it's, it's a huge thing. It's a huge topic. It's a huge um, problem, I guess. I, I mean, how do you feel about that? It's... I don't think it's a problem. It's a concern that we need to be aware of and, and hopefully teach our kids not to do it. Yeah. But I think the more we become aware of it and we can teach before it starts, the better off we are. I agree. And, and I appreciate the very obvious reasons for that, that we discussed, but I also appreciate you bringing up those reasons that are not so obvious, like the person that had the pictures of his 16 year old girlfriend, his 15 year old girlfriend, and he was the same age. And now he's 18 or she's 18. And now things are totally different for them in terms of their liabilities. I think that's something that, um, I certainly didn't know and didn't think about. And so that's very, very eye opening. I appreciate you sharing that. You're welcome. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. If you are interested in being a guest just like Stacy on this show, please follow us at Mom Nation USA. That's our handle. We're on YouTube. We're on Instagram. We're not on all these crazy other things that she was talking about because we don't know what they are. <laughs> but we are on all of the major ones, Facebook and the like. So please send us a message. Let us know why you would like to be a guest with us here. And while you're at it, and listening to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, please subscribe, download, and rate us so that we can get this information out to the people that need to hear it. All right, Stacey. Well, thank you again for being with us. Thank you, Katie. And remember, we have information on our Facebook page as well. Oh, yes. CanalCountyAttorney.org. Please share that. I'm actually got you uh, linked in the show notes. So I do have that information out there, but if there's any other place that we, that our moms can follow um, or message you, please definitely share that. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Bye. Bye.